So I set out to prove that Mass Effect Andromeda isn't the utter dumpster fire failure that everyone would have you believe. Though stick around because the results may shock you. I am shocked! SHOCKED! Andromeda was released in 2017 to middling reviews and frankly divisive opinions from fans. Now, years later, my goal is to find out if it really was as bad as many say, if it holds up to today's standards, and most of all, why it wasn't as big of a hit as the original trilogy. Though, what I end up finding out is something completely and hilariously different. So your character Ryder awakens after being cryogenically frozen for over 600 years, and what's the first thing he does? Crack jokes. I've been taking it easy for 600 years. An impressive feat considering even Austin Powers needed time to get his bearings. Oh yes, buckle up, it only gets better. Now, further into the game, you're gonna start to think that maybe you have something wrong with you for not laughing out loud at the amazing writing. Huh. Oh my god, that wasn't really all that funny. That's weird. Um. To your credit, you're not going crazy. The zingers per second rate is higher than a 90s Disney sitcom. But yes, you are the problem. Shepard sold the power fantasy too hard. The story was too riveting and drove us forward too confidently. What really benefits Andromeda is being able to play a dysfunctional bunch of outcasts who remove any narrative immersion and stakes by taking absolutely nothing seriously no matter what choices you make. And we ran and we hit in a giant tire. Oh yeah, and my other friend was already there. All right, all right now, you're overstimulated. You can pick between emotional, logical, casual, and professional toned responses. And if that's all a bit too complicated for your simple smooth brains, let me summarize for you. Every choice is pointless and the tone doesn't matter. Just pick one quickly because it has no impact on your character or the outcomes of the conversation. Why is this next level innovation? Because the Paragon and Renegade system had you picking a response based on how you want to progress your character. So instead of Andromeda locking you in, in the same way, they removed any outcome of choice completely because let's face it, we all know you Zoibergs would pick the wrong one and have to say goodbye to Rex again. You bastard. What have I done? Not today, friend. I don't know what everyone's going on about. The facial animations here aren't so bad. Look at the eye movements, the little smirk. He looks like he's deep in thought. So I should mention you're on a human arc ship looking for a golden world to colonize. Naturally, you crash into a completely avoidable space fence that will have you questioning if the ship actually has a captain, just so your sister can fall into a coma. Or if you choose to play as the sister, your brother falls into a coma. So your choice of male or female can influence who gets promoted and who gets made redundant, much like the conversations HR have with hiring agents in 2024. Put a ticket in. After a long intro, we're finally able to move our character and I immediately fail the first objective by daring to look around. I click on the door and get a big red X placed over the check on your sister optional portion of the quest. I run over to my vegetable sibling, whom I could do nothing to help this second, bar getting advanced medical training installed in my brain, Matrix style. And I'm locked out of talking to the doctors who are still standing by her coffin. Knowing I'll get some kind of guilt trip later on, I do what any rational gamer would do, quick reload the latest save, 14 seconds into being able to actually move around. What do you know, approaching her tomb starts a conversation in which I'm told she is fine and there's nothing I can do. To think of all the time I wasted on you! I'm glad I did this totally necessary busy work that devs knew would trigger our gamer OCD. Our sister is much better off now that I approached her bathtub and triggered another cinematic event while the whole cryo ship filled with 20,000 people was in immediate life-threatening danger only moments after I get freedom to move around. But if she's anything like her brother, she'd make an awesome joke about being put on ice. It's a joke. To break the ice? Get it? Oh no, now I'm sad I won't get to hear what could have been. So I spend a bit of time looking around the ship to mourn the loss of my sister, who at this point I was fully emotionally invested into, and realized I needed to update my key binding so the scanner is on mouse button 5. Since pressing buttons is hard for me, and the game will no doubt give you almost negligible rewards for scanning everything, but require you to do it for every single mission, so naturally I'm now delighted to do just that literally everywhere I walk, really immersing me into this world. You son of a bitch, I'm in! Speaking of immersion, I got lost in the deep, rich lore of the trilogy, especially listening to and reading through the codexes. The Asari were the first species to discover the Citadel. Naturally, Andromeda, its sequel, has a much lighter codex, doing away with that pesky, helpful narration and all that well thought out lore because Ain't nobody got time for that. Alex Ryder's face is actually really well done and his voice actor is audible chocolate. But if this goes well, 
we're already home. You know what I'd love? If he's already in the game for an hour and he makes all other human faces look absolutely gorgeous in comparison. Yes, the ship has a captain and look at the sheer range of emotions displayed on her face. I personally love how her Botox cheeks don't move while you can see the grease and the individual acne scars on Alex's face. So we approach the golden world that thousands of people set out to colonize over 600 years ago to find out it's not exactly what we thought it would be. So we need to plan it for and check it out. This means suiting up with Cora Harper. Don't comment on her outfit though, she just likes smooshing her marshmallows together into one fantastic super boob. And to calm her tits and keep them flying off into the void of space, she has a booby belt. Say what you want about Andromeda, it does build genuine intrigue at the start, with unknown problems being thrown at you while encouraging you to solve them. I was curious, what is wrong with the planet? What has happened during those 600 years? Why do we have enemies already? I really hope the answers to these aren't given away almost immediately. Poor predictable Bart. So you land on the planet and break your flimsy glass helmet. This might lead you to believe that Shepard's N7 helmet design was more practical in a combat scenario, but get stuffed it's not, because this way you can see Ryder's stupid face give off a plethora of emotion. I was sad learning I can now move around and control my character because I wanted more uncontrollable cutscenes. The movement is immediately better than Mass Effect 1, 2 and 3 though, it's freeform and you aren't locked into particular pathways or areas. You can jump, dodge, hover and launch off skills from all angles. Clearly the inspiration for Anthem, whose combat and movement had no bearing on its failure and was actually one of its highlights. So after a short stroll we run into the antagonist of the game, the Ket. I got it! It's coming right for us! <laughs> I immediately attack them and my crewmate says, I knew they weren't the friendly sword. Whew, potential first contact PR nightmare avoided. This Liam guy is a true bro. Fist bump, bro. So back to Scandromeda. I engage in some more combat. The powers actually feel quite good. I'm playing a new game plus, so I have a bit more choice at the start. But I chose to start as an adept. Naturally, classes in Andromeda aren't like they were in the trilogy. No, that would be too awesome. Instead, you can choose a class, but it has no impact on you at all. You can change all of your skills and your profile which is a passive buff based around combat tech or biotics or different combinations of them. What's the trade-off of such freedom of choice? Well, you can have three whole skills equipped at any time, which is far too many. Unless you hot swap profiles, which lets you swap between different builds as you play, but you're not going to want to. But I don't want to! Putting aside the lovely system that has replaying the game as a different build completely redundant, the skills have serious impact and the sound design is incredibly well done. Skills arc around cover and look great. I was using push and pull at the start which had me launching my enemies into orbit or setting off biotic combos that cleared waves with ease. But don't you dare try to take out enemies before they drop from their ship, you goddamn cheaters. Biotics are a lot of fun and don't worry, it's not contagious. Don't worry, it's not contagious. <laughs> Well, actually, Cora says this because she's been persecuted her whole life for being different and having powers, and you discover later on she was part of the Asari command unit, which accepted her abilities instead of fearing them, so she's just relaying to Liam preemptively that he shouldn't fear her. Did, did Cora just Superman punch a guy that's 100 meters in the sky just to kill steal me? Well, naturally, I had to see if she'd do it again. I'm just getting warmed up. She sadly didn't take the bait. So we make it to an alien structure that the Ket are defending. The idea is this structure has something to do with the weird weather on the planet. This is a do or die situation, so naturally as we're trying to hack into the structure using our AI called Sam, while defending our position from ways of enemies, Liam throws out an amazing one-liner that cuts through all of the tension and really sets our mind at ease. <laughs> I think I really pissed that one off. Maybe because I shot him in the face. So your dad finally makes it to the vault and changes the weather. Not at all making you immediately think that this alien tech was left on the planet to terraform and has gone wrong somehow in their absence and the Ket are trying to harness its power. Nah, no one would think that and it won't be danced around in the narrative like it's a secret. Of course something then explodes because fuck you and your dad of course sacrifices himself for you because in an extremely unlikely twist of fate, your glass combat helmet breaks again. You must be thinking, damn, what asinine and lazy ass riding having a universe famous explorer and N7 agent dying a completely avoidable death by suffocation when rotating masks back and forth would have saved them both, or even if he had just a standard issue backup mask, but it's actually big brain riding because this way you get to be king baby. Gonna be a mighty king, so enemies beware. 
you see Simba is smiling when he's given his dad's Pathfinder monarchy. Don't worry, if you feel like Ryder moved on super quick after Mufasa's death, you'll be reminded about him constantly throughout the game to the same level of emotional detachment. Mm, well, actually, Dan, Alec was an absent father their whole lives in this initiative. The good news is, well, remember gaining the Spectre status part of Mass Effect 1, where you felt special, badass, and different from your peers? A moment in any RPG that makes you feel unique. Well, you get that here. You're now the Pathfinder, and your special ability is being fully connected to an AI. Thanks, of course, to your dad dying. It's truly an impactful moment that you'll care about. Hey, just because I don't care doesn't mean I don't understand. So finally, the game cuts to the badass main villain. Look at this intimidating as fuck beast slow walking to the vault like he doesn't give a shit. Like I've said in this video here, what makes a great RPG is a badass protagonist and antagonist. You see, this main villain doesn't at all look like a fucking toddler who just woke up from a sleepy nap nap special time. Oh, he's a cutie. Do you want a bottle of num nums before daddy gets home, big boy? Just so you know, this isn't him having a tantrum and stomping off, laying his arms and boiling away like a big boy. Look, the stakes really are sky high in Andromeda. The planets are bust, so we get back on the Ark and fly to the unfinished Citadel 2.0. We commence the only erotic docking procedure and travel on a tram with a completely finished cinematic, which looks super normal by the way and not at all a disco-like animation you'll have to suffer through a thousand times before the game is complete. It turns out the people on Citadel 2.0 have a few problems of their own. They arrived months before you and have gone through uprisings and completely avoidable problems you'll spend all your time trying to fix because their problems are yours. Even though your job is finding a habitable planet and settling thousands of people, you'll be relied on for intergalactic finance, diplomacy, engineering, and scanning literally everything in sight. Now, I know you all can't wait to get stuck into this game, but if I haven't convinced you yet, check this out. Here we have the meme herself, the Colonial Affairs leader, Miss Tired Sorry, Face. my face is tired from dealing with everything. Whose lack of facial animations were so good that Bioware patched her into clarifying that her face is tired, in a successful attempt in convincing us that the lack of any movement is because she lacked enough sleep or nutrition. Yes, the first thing she says to you is, Nice to see some friendly faces. Hungry faces. Any supplies you can spare would be appreciated. In an attempt to extort food out of you, a crew of 20,000 who only just arrived from a 600 year journey. How dare you hold food out on her? Just look at her Hungry face. Faces. If she wasn't already likable enough, she doesn't believe in you from the get go. No one really does. This is so the writers can beat you over the head with the prove everyone wrong narrative while also making the main character negligent in almost every way. Of course, this is because the devs know the primary demographic are people who want to do nothing and take nothing seriously, but also be shown the utmost respect. I don't get no respect at all. Enter the superintendent Kesh, a female Krogan. You might be thinking, damn, it's almost like the writers inserted the female Krogan in for the sake of being different and they have zero idea of the lore established by the writers that came before them. Then it makes no sense that she'd be a valued ship superintendent because where would she get such skills in a society who lack those skills? Why would they let one leave on an Ark ship as anything but a broodmother? It's a living. Because fuck you, that's why. Uh, well actually Dan, there was mention in the original trilogy that there was a clan of all female Krogan and their tradition of Speaking of changing the law because they know what's best for us, the Asari have changed too. But more in a physical sense, they now all look like this. Chubby cheek cuties that don't at all look like a bee stung them violently. Don't worry though, if a conversation isn't a cinematic, it will still lock your camera at a fixed point, but won't zoom in to see the emotions of a character you're talking to, so this way the devs can hide the animations. It may seem like a weird angle and may seem very awkward, but fuck you. Sadly, the Solarians look the same, but they do lose a lot of the haste that their race is known for. Explaining the trilogy as having a higher metabolism and a shorter lifespan. However, director Tan, being voiced by Kamal Nanjani, has an almost lazy tone to it. He wasn't here when we left the Milky Way. Like he'd rather be napping. Also, since he's a man in a leadership position, he's naturally a giant incompetent douchebag that does everything he can to look good and seize more power. You better not give sass to this queen as well. If I pull this off, maybe you'll look like the leader you pretend to be. But first, you have to succeed at being the Pathfinder you pretend to be. I digress, it's at this point that you'll be introduced to the entirely optional strike team's mechanic. 
Andromeda was released with multiplayer missions in mind, and I had a bit of fun with them at release, but Bioware, in their infinite wisdom, foresaw that many would not want to or not be able to play these missions with others. So with strike teams, you can hire, train up, and send out proxies to do these for you. After an amount of time, they return with a failure or success, granting you rewards and leveling that team up. It's a surprisingly deep system. To get started, walk over to this console. Sam will tell you that the console is for strike team missions and that you should talk to Kandros, who is standing right next to the console. You might think you have to look around for him since it would be easy enough for him to say, hey, I noticed you're looking at the console. This is what it does. That's the console for our strike teams. But no, that's for morons. Instead, you've got to manually walk up to him and ask. So what could have been one click is now three clicks and extra time spent. This is a perfect example as to what you can expect all the way through Andromeda. Big brain moments letting you enjoy more time with the game. Oh, and I almost forgot, Turians are now always sitting on invisible bar stools. See? Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. Since we're on the Citadel 2.0, let's go shopping. Walk up to Quasimodo here and have a perfectly natural conversation. <laughs> Of course, you can't afford anything yet. I mean, you've only just spent 30 minutes actually being able to move around, so let's do one of the side missions here to make some credits. One of the engineers on the station has discovered sabotage. Sabotage, yeah. So naturally, this means we're gonna do a whole lot of walking around and scanning. God damn it! Which is fun because I was doing that anyway. And we trace it back to this bloke here. See, you confront him for sabotaging the station and his reaction is so unnatural for someone being caught red-handed that it really hits home that he is angry. Just look at his face. You're pretty arrogant for the new kid. You don't even know what's been going on. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So I got some cash. I could spend hours soothing the gamer OCD doing the metric ton of completely mind-blowing fetch quests given to you at this point, but it's time to move on to bigger and better things like getting my spaceship. Just look at this beauty. Say what you want, the devs do a fantastic job of making your ship one of the characters you care about. Exploring the universe has to be my personal highlight of the game. At this point, you're introduced to the ship's features. Like a pretty impressive research and development mechanic where you can further customize the nitty gritty of your character with custom gear. It can be further customized with mods that can drastically change the function of said gear. Like making a rifle now shoot a beam instead of shooting hot mass. Wait, where do these thermal clips come from? I thought weapons cooled down. They used to. After the Geth attack a few years back, we switched to thermal clips. Well, that sounds like a major step backward. It lets guns fire with more power, and soldiers can pop in a new clip instead of waiting for the gun to cool. Fine, sure. You can still wait for your gun to cool down on its own though, right? No, the in-gun cooling tech was sacrificed to make room for the- Oh right, did everyone forget the guns in Mass Effect don't shoot bullets, and ammo is just how much heat your heat sinks store before they get ejected, because it seems like Andromeda forgot, but nah, that's just your imagination. Max ammo? Whoopsie! Let's move on to meeting the pilot. After three games of Joker, it'll be interesting to- Whoa, he flew out of his seat. What the hell? <laughs> this is kind of jarring. A pilot that gets up and walks around? I admit it, guys, this is the single least Mass Effect part of the game that I have seen, even though everything else has been absolutely perfect. Alright, sit down if you're not already sitting down. At this point, you might be wondering, does my character respect personal boundaries and accommodate everyone's triggers, immersion and fun be damned? I needed to know myself, so naturally, I, purely for research purposes, proceeded to use the flirt option on our ship's, well, science liaison. I guess Ryder needs a translator to explain all those big sciencey words, so I offered to help her with danger and guns. I'm good with guns and danger. I could teach you and make sure you're okay out there. I appreciate the offer, but I'm happy where I am, tinkering in labs. And uh, in case you offered hoping to get to know me better, that's not gonna work. I mean, I prefer to keep things professional. I understand completely. Slow down! You may be thinking, damn, the only serious moment in the entire game is getting rejected, but fuck you. Hey, baby, feel like getting lucky? I am lucky. I have a husband and three wonderful children. Thank you very much. Listen, baby, I always get 
what I want. I said no. Oh, did you? Oh, I completely misunderstood. Please accept our apologies. And if you still haven't gotten the message, try flirting with the ship's Dr. Lexi, who has a serious case of Andromeda Asari cheeks. I had no idea. I'd love to hear more. Over dinner, maybe? Oh, um, thing is, Ryder, you're not my type. What's your type? Not a patient. I need to be able to look at you clinically without distractions. Am I distracting? Not nearly as much as you think you are. In this case, Ryder wrongly tries to brush it off with humor and Lexi rightly crushes his ego, which Ryder takes like a proper good boy. See, she can't run away from you fast enough. Just because you're living out an intergalactic fantasy doesn't mean you can't be reminded how pathetic you are. After all, this is what sells games. But all you pigs out there, don't worry, you can flirt with the female Turian when she's not sitting on her invisible bar stool. Wow, that's some laser focus. Yeah? Was it too much? Some people get intimidated. We need that sort of drive. I just hope I can keep up. You'll keep up. And I promise I won't tell if you don't. <laughs> Gross. Now, you might have just seen her sitting on an actual chair, but that was just an illusion to throw you off the fact that the exchange actually fit the character. Speaking of fitting the character, here we have Cora Harper with her boss haircut. Long hair flicked to one side that you can't tie up because getting hair in your eyes is an act of mercy by giving your enemies a chance to run. Here's the concept art of her too, which is too practical and too feminine. I, for one, am glad they gave her the harsh shave. It really says, I'm a powerful woman. You may be thinking, they really can't put traditionally attractive women in games anymore, but just wait till you see what she's hiding. So our next objective is to travel to the planet Eos, another golden world that has ended up being less than desirable. So let me take a moment to talk about the universe map and transitions. This is absolutely gorgeous and like I mentioned before, one of the best things about Andromeda by far. Instead of loading between worlds, an animation plays of you flying to the system, then down to the object or the planet. Almost like you're watching the journey from the window of your ship. You click on the area you want to travel to and the camera takes you there. If Starfield used this system, I doubt anyone would have complained about loading times and traveling between worlds. It makes space exploration fun and I found myself clicking around simply to read more about the planets and the systems as well as find points of interest and extra resources, which there are plenty of. Speaking of exploring, after hours of playing, you finally get to explore an open area. Slow down! I want to get there, but I want to get there alive! Well, not quite yet. You have to scan some things, fight some cat, eavesdrop on some ghosts, and open a big box and get your car first. But then you get to explore the fully open... Oh, wait, wait, you need to first terraform the planet a bit and then get raped by a rabid alien. Back up, literally. Whoa, easy. You've come this far, just let it ride. I'm not familiar with the type of thing I'm seeing. Where do I start with this scene? First, it may seem like a slow, unarmed civilian runs past a group of trained elite scouts and tackles the commanding officer with no repercussions. It may seem strange and grating that you just met a person, she attacks you, and you immediately shake her hand like she's being friendly, and it may seem like a completely moronic way to introduce a character, seeing as there was zero need for her to violently tackle you to the ground, as her objective was to simply watch what would happen when you activated the console she just stopped you from activating. It may seem like her saying, let it ride, convinces your squad to lower their weapons and it may seem like she looks dopey as hell but this scene just works because fuck you Now, all that practice you had scanning pays off as every single time you visit a planet, you'll be scanning to follow yellow lines to find squares and doing a short puzzle that doesn't really get any harder at every alien ruins you find. I'm very thankful of this since they don't at all get repetitive. Like I mentioned, even though you're allowed to drive around right now, the whole planet isn't unlocked for you. You need to terraform it first by following the main objective, activating towers by, you guessed it, scanning, and then traveling below ground to scan some other things. Between these moments though, is pesky gameplay. 
gameplay like this. And sometimes you can make aliens go boom. It may seem fun, but fun is just an unnecessary distraction from the main driving force of Scandromeda. Speaking of boom, enter the best character in Mass Effect Andromeda, Drac. A Grandpa Krogan. If you know anything about the Krogan, it's that they have an extremely long lifespan and almost none of them get to it. So an old man Krogan must be badass, which is not at all undercut by his first line. Who are you? What? Now that's a perfect delivery. Now imagine if Alex Ryder's voice actor took this role. Ugh. We need to know if that's safe harbor. Now you may feel with your tiny inferior human brain meats that Drac should have been the one to tackle you to the ground and PB should have been the one walking up to you slowly without anyone flinching, but you'd be wrong. Foolish earth creature. Here at the new Bioware, we subvert typical expectations. It also subverts it by not having him join you right away. Have to say, I was disappointed! But I quickly took my frustration out of my enemies. And of course, a bit of scanning to help calm me down. So I scan all the way down to the vault, where I can unlock the true potential of the terraformer and really open this planet up for exploration. While on my way down, PB has some pretty important things to say, which permanently gets interrupted by a cinematic as I slowly continue down the path. Pattern things are incredible. If I'm right. It was my mistake for not stopping completely every time my crew has something to say. The devs didn't have time to plan out the distances of halls to align with the conversations. It's pretty common knowledge that in RPGs, you shouldn't be walking towards your objective, unless it's your sister's coffin, of course. Then you better make sure you don't detour at all. Remember, you have yellow lines to follow. Yeah, keep following. Would you kids like to come with me? Okay. Sounds good to me. Let's so. go. Don't you dare try and save. You see, in this whole 30 minutes to well over an hour excursion, you are forbidden to save. Yes, even outside of combat, because how dare you take your eyes off the yellow brick road for even a second, you... Insolent fool boy! It's a good thing you can't save, because once you reach the end of the road, you're greeted by the same smoke that killed your dad. Well, stupidity killed him, but this kind of had a hand, right? You have to make a quick heroic exit, and nothing would be better than failing and getting to do it all over again. Let's do that again! No, no! Once you're out, pat yourself on the back. You can finally save, and you've reduced the radiation in the atmosphere somehow. The next time you visit the planet, you'll be able to explore much more, but right now, you can establish your first outpost. So I drive on over to this perfect location, aka Sniper's Killbox Heaven Flood Prone Valley, and fight the Ket for this prime piece of real estate. Naturally, I outbid them. Now, as a wealthy real estate owner, Drac decides it's time to join up. Welcome aboard, that's all the loose ends. All that's left to do is to make a choice that will echo the outpost's direction for decades, according to Ryder. I'm choosing this outpost's direction for decades, maybe centuries. You can choose between making an outpost focus on science or military, working towards furthering the initiative's scientific future or securing their future on this planet. And before you ask, yes, it absolutely does impact the game. You get a whole two different lines of dialogue and I think you may get a small fetch quest for science and a line in the final battle for military or something, I don't know, it's not important. Just know that the choice matters. Consider it carefully. Both good. The important thing is I'm meeting new people. So I pick one of them, I can't remember which, and ships land and Hungry Face comes over to greet us. It's clear she's fucking ecstatic. Now there's a ton more we can do for this planet, including scanning for mining materials and scanning for alien ruins. But I'm already tired of EOS and want to experience more of the Citadel and see how it's changed. So I take a look at my missions and head back to the ship. It becomes very clear that your character is well respected for wanting everyone to get along. Okay, let's head back to the Nexus. I check on my strike teams, redeploy them, and head through the ship to check on my crewmates. It's a Bioware game after all, and no doubt they'll have more dialogue for me between missions. What do you know, they've all turned into little personal space invaders. Whoa, Lexi, it's almost like you didn't just run away from me earlier. I have no issue with Korra invading my space. And let me tell you, I care about my personal space. Whoa, whoa, hey, who's around me right now? So there's a heart soft as rose petals under that uniform. I got plenty under here, pal. It's too hot today. Let me remind you, I did say the devs haven't forgot their own lore. Here we have PB who talks like she can't get everything out of her brain in time. <laughs> 
Sorry, not really. Even my dreams are in time lapse. The Asari live for a thousand years and none are in a rush the way PB is. It may seem like even her backstory doesn't excuse this, and it may seem as though if this was a Solarian female model swapped in, she would make complete sense. But remember, our crew are a bunch of children subverting expectations. Established law is just law that hasn't been broken yet. No, I don't believe in nothing no more. I'm going to law school. So if you thought I haven't flirted with nearly enough males, here's me flirting with Liam. Yep. Here I go. Just let me back up safe first. Just stopping in to show some interest and see if it might be returned. Oh, flattered, Ryder, but I'm not into guys. Thanks, though. Still, answer me this. Would I be a one-night thing or do I read his marriage material? In-laws and picket fences, for sure. See, I get that a lot. Okay, that actually seemed believable. Direct, but believable. Now I gotta reload save. I can't let Liam the wanker have one over me. You are gay. <laughs> so the head engineer, let's see what he's into. Happy to be of service. I think you'll see that showing up is only one of my many talents. Is that right? Well, I'll be sure not to blink. I want to see them all. Let me know if I go too fast for you. <laughs> There's no such thing. You just keep pointing this ship wherever you want it to go, and I'll make sure she can get there. Deal? Okay, yeah, he's into it. Mm. <laughs> but no time for that, let's head to the bitch Suvi, who wasn't all that into it, and I'm not at all salty about her instantly rejecting us. When she starts talking about God, I couldn't resist calling her out on it. Stupid, stupid bitch doesn't even know. Granted, I only have the choice of agreeing with her or fully rejecting her, so naturally you know which one I chose. She explains that her senses tell her what the world is, science shows her how it came to be, and religion tells her why, but before that she tells us religion won't hinder her work. If everything was set in place by some mysterious creator, why even be a scientist? Yes, science! So I rip into her and what do you know, the stinky bitch takes the high road with a nice email. So my natural reaction was to fly the ship straight into a black hole with everyone on it. Don't worry, we were all fine and we made it to the Citadel 2.0. It's about time you get a hint of respect as the people appreciate that the initiative has made progress by settling a world. You get a little dialogue for your choice of settlement. With more military personnel out of stasis, those cat won't get near your vault. Or our people. Then again later. Though I worry about your decision on Eos, Ryder. A military outpost won't help feed the Nexus, not the way scientists might have. But it will protect us from a growing list of threats. Oh, it turns out I chose military, and what's her name isn't too happy about, so this makes me happy. This isn't the time for arguing over who gets to be king. Hey, this is Dan from the future. The choice is never again brought up. That's seemingly the extent of it, and that's all it needs to be. If you want consequence of choice, look for a game like the up and coming Exodus. Andromeda doesn't have time to waste with things that give results. Example, opening pods and getting people out of cryo now that we have places to house them. That takes the form of picking between science, military, and commerce pods. Not to be mistaken with the choice you made before. No, if you chose a military post, you can still choose to open science pods. It may seem like they should have linked these two features in some way to give actual consequence to choice in a tangible way, but fuck you, nah. So I chose to open a science pod full of lab technicians, which give me periodic research points throughout the game I can use for unlocking new things to craft. I take 10 more rides on the disco tram and end up dancing with this medic. It may look like I'm trying desperately to engage the quest and conversation, but you'd be mistaken. I'm only here for the dance and not at all fighting the controls. After a dance, I decide it's time to gear up and head to the next priority mission. On the way, I'm greeted by Evil Boss Baby in a totally intimidating showdown, and I make it to the planet I was directed to in the previous vault. Oh, did I gloss over there was a star map in the previous vault? Yeah, there was I guess. So you make Planetfall, and for the first time since we started, meet another sentient alien race. That makes two. In the same time frame in the first Mass Effect, you're introduced to 14. Yes, I counted. That's far too many. Two is much more manageable for my soft, squishy brain liquid. So how goes first contact? Well, we walk over there in a singlet, headphones, and joke about taking off our shoes. Need me to take my shoes off? The perfect first contact for the perfect hero. So trying to find the next vault is immediately hindered by fantastic voice acting. 
She's lost to us. And you. So naturally, we need to fly to a whole new planet to prove we can stand in the same room as that god. I do just that and try out my new combat focused loadout. I do some scanning and save some of the Angarans, which is Captain Grumpy Face's race, from a stasis trap. Naturally, they run away from me, which is an ongoing theme. I chase them down and have a chat to them. They end up being the nicest people possible, willing to give the shirts off their backs to strangers, even though they've been locked in a war with a cat for as long as they can remember. If you like, you can have all my money and my leg. Okay. You might be thinking, wow, everyone in this game is so chummy that there's very little conflict between people. Everyone is unnaturally nice and there's hardly any reality in personality types, viewpoints and so on. Technically you're correct, but you're also wrong for thinking that you bigot Nazi. What you see and what you say should be policed. Take this dialogue exchange with whatever his name is after you save his people. Respectfully, the Angara don't need anything from you. We take care of our own. I select, of course, apologies. Naturally, this means my character doesn't apologize at all and doubles down. What I meant was, let our scientists help with your program. Let my team join your effort. This is more closely related to what I actually want to say, so I'm glad the dialogue you're offered and what you actually say doesn't match at all. So I take to talking to my crew again. Naturally, I fail an objective I didn't know I had to read an email before talking to the person who sent me the email. It makes complete sense because now I can't go back and read it after talking to her and I should have been more thorough in the order I did things. Silly me. Oops. Thankfully, my failure is offset by the truly beautiful planetfall animations, which are all unique and happen each time you visit a new planet. I keep getting reminded how this would have been really something that would have made Starfield a winner. These plants feel like real places with their own unique stories. So I'm on this planet to save an Angaran from the Ket who knows the location of one of the vaults. So naturally, I slaughter the Ket with my new build. Combat feels very weighty and my new Black Widow rifle really packs a punch. Of course, at the end of this mission is the most obvious twist about the Ket that you'll definitely not see coming a mile away. Oh my god, what if the secret ingredient is people? Then I gun down the boss because it feels good and leave. Back on the ship, the writers refuse to let you miss the opportunity to flirt with Gil. I counted four flirt options after avoiding the choices completely each time. Maybe there's something about the engine room and big mass effect fields that gets the writers going. Though to be fair, that Miranda scene. The reason you can talk to aliens is that you all have built in translators. So naturally these translators translate idioms as well. But I have a good shoulder. That's kind. He has a good shoulder would normally sound like Ryder is explaining how strong the muscles on his shoulders are. Only the uneducated would appreciate funny idiom explaining moments in the writing. Too cliche, right? Might as well make this alien who has only just made contact basically human and move on. No time for that nonsense. Instead, let's focus more on things like this. Stars and skies light our way. Stars and skies light our way. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> We're back on the ice planet now and I love the way cold is handled in Andromeda. In Starfield, you're in an advanced spacesuit but still get frostbite in minus 10 degrees Celsius weather or start choking on gas coming out of vents. In Andromeda though, the extreme cold of over minus 50 degrees slowly drains your life support. The only side effect is the lower the temperature, the higher chance of bad ice puns. I appreciate the warm welcome. It's a joke. To break the ice. Get it? Warm welcome. Ice. All right, everyone. Chill. 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 Did I say bad? I meant so deliberately great that it's awesome. It has to be deliberate, right? Cringy main character that's never taken seriously says bad pun from a 90s Batman movie. Winning formula, really. So after a brief synopsis of the planet, I'm free to explore as I see fit. I have to say, driving around this ice ball is truly great. It brings a sense of freedom and wonder, and I'm constantly reminded just how much work the devs have put into this game. I know I've been a little hard on it, and I know my sarcasm has hit levels that drain life support faster than the Hazard Level 3 planet, but there are moments where I really believe this game has the potential to... The command base is just ahead. I know it's already pretty cold here, but stay extra frosty. Yeah, no, fuck this, I'm done. 